Hello. Welcome to the session dedicated to research and innovation actions within the two calls in cluster six destination biodiversity and ecosystem services. My name is Philippe Tulkens. I'm the head of the Climate and Planetary Boundaries Unit in DG Research and Innovation, and I will moderate with great pleasure this session. Please note that we would like to invite you, participants from all over the EU and beyond, to ask questions during the presentation using Slido and to upvote the questions that you consider most in, in, interesting. Next slide, please. So these are about the instructions for Slido. You can go to www.slide.do. I'm sure you're used to this as you followed probably a few months ago the previous sessions on this. You can insert the hashtag CL6 Info Day to join the event. And then you can select the room of the destination one, biodiversity and ecosystem services. You can also simply scan the QR code and select the appropriate room. I hope this is easy for you and that is not going too fast. To facilitate moderation of the Q&A, when you ask a question, we would like to request you to label the question with topic number. For example, if you are interested in aspects related to the topic Horizon CL6 2022, Biodiv 0106, Monitoring and Effective Measures for agro biodiversity, please put the number 06 and your question in Slido, of course. We will take as many questions as possible. Given the time, however, uh, as we have some time constraints, some questions will remain unanswered. Probably the most difficult one, joking. Please send them to the research inquiry service. We will reply there in written to all the questions. The most relevant and or repetitive questions will be included also in the frequently asked question. Questions are to be asked only on Slido, please, not in the chat of this session. During the session, we will favor questions related to the topics, general questions related to cluster six evaluation and so forth should have been already addressed in the plenary session. Next slide, please. In this session, we will first give an overview of the calls in 2022 within the destination biodiversity and ecosystem services. Then, colleagues will be briefly presenting to you the 2022 topics that are organized in the work program under the two calls indicated here. Number one is a single stage procedure and number two, a two stage call. Both calls will open this Thursday, 28 October and have their first deadline on 15th of February 2022. The proposal selected for the two stage topics will have to submit more details proposal by sem September 2022. Investment in r &I will help to put biodiversity on a path to recovery, to preserve ecosystem under multiple pressures and to restore their capacity to deliver a wide range of essential services. I would like to stress that most topics across the destination are open to both terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems, and we expect to fund excellent projects on biodiversity on land, sea and continent waters. For that, all knowledge on bio biodiversity status, pressures and responses need to be improved requiring even basic taxonomic work in certain ecosystems. Therefore, the first heading in our destination is understanding biodiversity decline on the left of the screen. It contains two topics in 2022, aiming to observe and map biodiversity and ecosystems and to build taxonomic capacity in Europe. The second heading, valuing and restoring biodiversity and ecosystem services, will develop tools to guide decisions and inform policies on the environment and related sectors, the two topics of this goal focusing on nature-based solutions and natural capital accounting. 
Biodiversity is also the basis for sustainable and resilient agriculture in 2022, uh, sorry, and agriculture. In 2022 calls, we will have a particular focus on our third heading, managing biodiversity in primary production, with six topics aiming to en enhance agrobiodiversity, to protect pollinators, and to make a better use of genetic resources in agriculture and forest. Three of these topics have a two-stage procedure. The fourth heading, enabling transformative change in biodiversity, is at the core of the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030. It contains two topics in 2022, aiming to initiate processes, behavior changes and actions which are transforming the way we impact biodiversity. This heading will fund socioeconomic and multidisciplinary research to accelerate transformative changes in our society that are relevant to biodiversity. The topic in fifth heading, Interconnecting Biodiversity Research and Supporting Policy, refers this year to the support of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Next slide, please. We can see here the general policy context for the biodiversity destination. I'm sure you know it well already. It focuses mainly on the policies related to the European Green Deal, notably the biodiversity strategy and farm to fork. The nature, direct, nature directives, the marine strategy and marine strategy framework, the agricultural policy, a key element, as well as the related international conventions and intergovernmental panels, such as the CBD for the convention, IBES and IPCC for the scientific panels. The EU biodiversity strategy for 2030 is, is a cornerstone of the Green Deal that would put European biodiversity on the path to recovery by 2030 for the benefit of people, the climate and the planet. With the Green Deal's do no significant harm vision, all EU policies will become more biodiversity friendly focusing more on the sustainable use of ecosystems, supporting the recovery in a post-pandemic world. Therefore, all research and innovation activities under this first destination of Cluster 6, Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, must help to deliver this main impact from Horizon Europe's tr strategic plan that fills the center of the slides here. It's a dream. Biodiversity is back on a path to recovery and ecosystems and their services are preserved and sustainably restored on land, inland water and at sea through improved knowledge and innovation. It's an aspiration, it's a dream. The challenge is to take this up in your activities. Results from research and innovation proje pro projects will certainly have an important impact on biodiversity, but also on food, health, water and climate, which are all interconnected. It will also enable transformational change, engaging Europe, European society and economy for their global impacts, making decisions more biodiversity friendly. The calls on this destination are expected to contribute to the five following impact areas. Enhancing ecosystem and bio, ecosystems and biodiversity on land and in water, climate change mitigation and adaptation, clean and healthy air, water and soil, sustainable food system from far to fork on land and sea. And then finally, a resilient EU prepared for emerging threats. Next slide, please. The proposal for topics under this destination should set out a credible pathway contributing to biodiversity and ecosystem services, and more specifically, to one or more of the, of the following impacts. First, biodiversity decline its main direct drivers and their interrelations are better understood and addressed. Second impact, biodiversity and natural impact are integrated into public and business decision making for the protection and restoration of ecosystems and their services. Science-based is provided for planning and expanding protected areas and for sustainably managing ecosystems. Europe builds competitive sustainability and tackles climate change and natural disasters through the deployment of nature-based solutions, also contributing to a green recovery across all European regions. This is a third very key impact that is expected. The interrelation between biodiversity, health, food, soil, water, air and climate are better known and communicated to citizens and policymakers. In particular, 
risks associated with bi microbiomes and opportunities for biodiversity recovery are identified. Next impact expected. Practices in agriculture and forestry support biodiversity and the provision of other ecosystem services. Access to a wider range of crops and breeds with a broadened genetic base is improved. More biodiverse resilient production systems will have positive effects on value chains, healthy diets, and biodiversity. Approaches for enabling transformative changes in society are developed. The do not not harm biodiversity policies become mainstream in all sectors. And final impact expected, biodiversity research is interconnected across Europe, supporting national, EU, and international policy conventions. This is a lot, of course, to do in small projects, but we know, uh, well, not so small, actually, in, in these projects, but we know how excellent the proposals are, and we count on you to uh, propose impactful um, activities that will help us in transforming and meet the objectives of the Green Deal. Next slide. So we can see here a global overview of the distribution of 2022 resources through the five headings of the biodiversity destination. We see that we have 20 million euros on understanding biodiversity decline, 16 million euros on valuing and restoring biodiversity and ecosystem services, 78 million euros on managing biodiversity in primary production, 8 million euros on enabling transformative change on biodiversity, and 5 million euros on interconnecting biodiversity research and supporting policies. More than half of the actions are research innovation actions, and there are also four innovation actions and two coordination and support actions. Overall, this is a, a, an impressive budget uh, for the area, uh, more than in the past, if I recall probably. And this is welcome, but the challenge is huge, and the impact is, I expect are, expected are numerous. So we count on you to propose impactful proposal. Next slide, please. And here we are on the time to place your question through Slido. So after the introduction of the, the destination, we will present all the topics in four batches, four today and two tomorrow. After each batch of topics, presentation will open the Q&A discussion in Slido, as mentioned earlier. We will take as many questions as possible, given the time, as I said before. However, if some questions will remain unanswered, as I said before, please uh, send them to the Research Inquiry Service. We will repro reply in written form. The replies will be then publicly available. The most repetitive, important questions or frequently asked will also put, be put on the FAQ section. I would like now to have, um, take a moment to let you ask some questions on this general introduction, uh, if, if any. No? <laughs> Then, uh, if, well, since I opened the floor, I think I have to. <laughs> and uh, if there's any general question, um, please ask them. I'll try to repl reply to them myself, because if I gave the introduction, I should be able to provide the, the uh, general answers as well. And if, if there is no question, we will move on to the presentation of each topic. Are the study areas confined to Europe only? Um, no, of course. Uh, as you know, this program is open to the world, and uh, all uh, participants from other countries can also apply, but there are different conditions applying to the, uh, the respective countries, whether they have to come with their own funding or whether they can be funded by uh, Horizon Europe themselves. The conditions have been updated in comparison to Horizon 2020, and they are clearly uh, described in the documents presenting Horizon Europe and, and, and the calls. So if there is no other question, let's move on now for the first presentation that will be made by Ivan Conesa, and it's about observing and mapping biodiversity and ecosystem, especially in the marine and coastal areas. Ivan, the floor is yours. 
Good morning. Thank you, Philippe. Um, I will start right away. Uh, this topic, as you can see now, um, is supporting uh, implementation of the strategies which are interconnected, strategies constituting the European Green Deal, in particular the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030. Uh, next slide, please. It will uh, contribute to uh, the targets of enlarging the protected areas, their identification, their connectivity. It will serve for regular and timely observation and assessment of the effectiveness of measures and of the good or environmental status for the Marine Strategic Framework Directive and to inform as well the implementation of the Water Framework Directive and the good ecological status. Observing, mapping and predicting tools predicting tools, sorry, uh, will help to step up the implementation and uh, the adaptation of maritime spatial plannings and to define ad hoc holistic ecosystem-based management. For all this, we need to develop the next generation of fit for purpose and user-friendly integrated tools for marine, coastal and terrestrial biodiversity observation and prediction in four dimensions, including the water column, time and seasonal changes. The activities undertaken in this topic will contribute to have the marine and coastal biological processes being integrated into national and regional, European and global observation system, notably to the Global Biodiversity Observation Network, GeoBone, and its marine component, <clears throat> MBone. As we are acquiring now and more and more new knowledge and understanding of marine ecosystem processes and other biodiversity, biodiversity threats below the surface. This topic will contribute to map and better model energy and nutrient cycle, and as well as better carbon balance estimation in the different ecosystem within the European exclusive economic zone. Consequently, the scope of the topic, as you can see, some underlined in the next slide. Next slide, yes, thank you. Uh, is to provide new data and uh, proxies for in-situ biodiversity threats from species, biomass, assemblage, functions and processes like food web, life cycles, and to be strong biological and ecological components that can be integrated with physical and geochemical ones for improved marine ecosystems modeling. Integrate a variety of new and existing sensors for in situ, like autonomous unmanned vehicles, acoustic monitoring devices, and integrate holistic approaches like systems biology, metaomics, and novel theoretical frameworks linking evolutionary theory together with oceanography, and to link all this to remote sensing applications. Then we expect, of course, the topic to contribute to the European Earth Observation Program, Copernicus, the Group on Earth Observation, as well as the European Space Agency Earth Observation Program, especially the flagship's action on biodiversity and ocean health of the Joint uh, European Commission and ESA, Joint Earth System Science Initiative to develop standardized minimum set of essential ocean and biodiversity variables, and to cover, of course, as well, algal and jellyfish blooms and invasive alien species to better feed policies and their prevention, eradication, and management. The project also will be an opportunity to raise the overall societal and public understanding of the link between biodiversity and ecosystem functioning and health through outreach and possible education. And lastly, to provide recommendation and a blueprint for fast track integration and, develop and deployment of new ob observation tools, applications and data into existing aquatic biodiversity observation services. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan. And I didn't say it before, but of course, uh, the slides will be available. These slides are very dense. Uh, we all know that it's difficult also to follow online, online and to have the constant attention. All the material recorded here will be available online uh, afterwards. So you can take all the time to read it out. The next presentation will be given by uh, Josefina Enfedake on uh, building taxonomic research capacity near, bio, near biodiversity hotspots 
and for protected areas by networking natural history museums and other taxonomic facilities. Have you seen how short the title is? Josefina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Philippe. I apologize in advance because the slides are also very dense too. Uh, this is an innovation action and we can see in the next slide the policy context and the outcomes that we want to achieve. Um, uh, this is in the context, of course, of the Green Deal and the EU Biodiversity Strategy for 2030. It also addresses the, the nature directives, birds and habitats, and it's about transferring local taxonomic knowledge, innovation and expertise across Europe. I would say central and local, both. Um, it is also important uh, in a policy way to um, to uh, give the knowledge uh, to protect endangered species, uh, other relevant taxonomic groups, and to understand and address biodiversity decline. So this innovation action uh, has a lot of expected outcomes, and you will see in the next slide, the, don't pass it yet, <laughs> the, out, the scope is very wide because we want to to cover the field from the networking and the capacity building of taxonomy. Um, to increase the, the local taxonomic knowledge and the expertise through a network of expert trainers. But we don't want to do only what a CSA, a coordination and support action would do. We want to go forward and to give also the innovation aspects. So to create, uh, to create the knowledge and to go forward to create national reference collections or to improve them for pollinators in particular, and, and to improve the digital networking and the research capacity in near biodiversity hotspots and protected areas. Uh, it's about resources, advice, expertise from museums, new, new taxonomy methods, new technologies that need to be tested in situ. It's also about building and putting at the disposition of the community and of the wider uh, user community reference data sets that link DNA data and specimens. It's about new identification methodologies and new digital applications to use this taxonomic knowledge. Uh, and this is about most of all networking, the network of professional taxonomists with the citizen scientists and the amateur um, um, taxonomists and end users worldwide. Uh, this is also one of the output outcomes that we expect from this project is um, to think forward, to make a strategy and to set in place already some pilot actions to improve uh, taxonomy curricula uh, in the in the education, higher education system and professional careers to address uh, the taxonomist shortage. In the next slide, we know more about this taxonomist shortage. Traditionally, uh, expert taxonomy trainers are in, in uh, natural history museums and other taxonomic facilities, such as the ones belonging to the Consortium of European Taxonomic Facilities, the CETAF. But it is needed everywhere. It's increasingly needed for conservation efforts, to combat invasive species, to sustainable manage forests, uh, fields and seas, and uh, we have uh, noticed that, uh, well, the community and the users have noticed that there is no local taxonomic um, infrastructure and expertise in particular near um, protected areas and biodiversity hotspots, uh, because all this expertise is in the museums and in the biodiversity centers. So we would like to strengthen this taxonomic expertise in Europe promote it in, in official curricula and businesses because there is a shortage of taxonomies and the ones the current generation is aging so we really need uh, to, to make this generational change and uh, we need to develop plans for international cooperation and encourage the engagement of these taxonomies in wide ecological research projects and in the private sector uh, to secure their career development. Um, one Another part of the scope is to establish or improve, as one of the outcomes uh, says, the reference collections for pollinators, for soil fauna and for freshwater taxa, which are because they have... Uh, enormous um, economic importance, and also including invasive alien species in all European countries. But one important aspect of this innovation action is the support and the creation of the support of pilot local nodes uh, with grants to build local capacity. This project has cascade funding, so at up to one third of the funding might go to third parties 
to build web labs, to build, to build a connected computer infrastructure, nodes and remote communication, and to promote their links to European infrastructures for this taxonomic flow of knowledge, specimens and information. And finally, uh, but very importantly, uh, Part of the scope is to involve the networks of amateur taxonomists and to increase the citizen science aspect of taxonomy, to do a strategic mapping and an agenda for taxonomic expertise in Europe and identify the needs for future actions, uh, whilst also uh, bridging the gender and geographical gaps. The budget is 6 billion euro for one project because we want really to do this uh, coordination and this networking. And uh, one important aspect is the cascade funding, uh, up to 30% of the project, but with limits of 200,000 euro per third party funded. Um, so this project can give grants. Uh, important is, as mentioned, the citizen science component, and it needs to collaborate with project resulting from a previous call, the, the one in 2001 on uh, methods and data for taxonomic uh, science and of course with the consortium for Europea, of European taxonomic facilities and the European infrastructures uh, dealing with uh, taxonomic data and, and digital infrastructures like LifeWatch, Disco and Elter. Thank you very much Josefina for this clear and rich uh, presentation, much appreciated. Um, now we will move on to the third presentation, which will be given by uh, Tiago Freitas on a network for nature, multi-stakeholder dialogue platform to promote nature-based solution. Tiago, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Philippe, and good morning, everyone. So this is a coordination and support action, uh, which aims to establish a multi-stakeholder dialogue platform to promote nature-based solutions. On the next slide, we will see the policy background. Um, so as we uh, most of all know, nature-based solutions contribute to the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030 and also to many other Green Deal priorities through the provision of key ecosystem services. Uh, a multi-stakeholder platform is uh, very much necessary to support and consolidate the understanding of nature-based solutions to promote their use and to speed up market uptake and wider implementation. This topic will contribute to deploying NBS more widely and to fully reaping their economic, social and environmental benefits in order to build a competitive sustainability in Europe and to tackle climate change. Uh, as for the expected outcomes, uh, we expect that with this uh, topic, uh, the community of innovators, practitioners and developers of NBS will be enhanced. Uh, so engaged across communities of science, business, policy and practice. Uh, also the engagement with public authorities, private sector and society at large for implementing and investing in nature-based solutions. Uh, cooperation with key strategic EU and international partners to develop standards and foster the emergence of global market for nature-based solutions. And uh, uh, NBS uh, knowledge uh, is consolidated across different sectors and disciplines uh, through uh, regional and Europe-wide transdisciplinary collaboration, advisory services, knowledge transfer and skills development. Uh, on the next slide, we can see um, the scope of the topic. We uh, expect uh, pr uh, proposals to uh, improve engagement with public authorities, the private and financing sector and society at large to implement and invest in nature-based solutions. Uh, they should maintain a stakeholder platform that facilitates the interaction within and between NBS knowledge holders and implementers. Uh, also support communication and outreach campaigns and regular events in all member states. Uh, facilitate the clustering of EU-funded NBS uh, projects uh, and promote the uptake of their results in further EU or national initiatives. Uh, assist the Commission in organizing science policy workshops and assessing the contribution of NBS to global and EU policies. Uh, also facilitate the development of guidelines for practitioners with state-of-the-art NBS design practices and protocols. 
develop mechanisms for capacity building and knowledge sharing across disciplines and further develop and maintain existing databases uh, of facts and figures on NBS cost effectiveness, including in monetized form. Uh, of course, there is much more. I invite you all to read the topic text. Um, the indicative budget here is 6 million euros and one project to be selected. It's very important here to consider the collaboration with other NBS projects in Horizon 2020 and in Horizon Europe, uh, including their task forces where projects work together on themes of common interest for more uh, EU added value and here this uh, network will have a crucial uh, function of uh, facilitating this clustering uh, activities. Uh, social sciences and humanities should be clearly uh, included in this project and also the outputs uh, should be visible on OPLA, the EU repository of nature-based solutions. Uh, this is all for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Thiago. Uh, let's move on to the last uh, topic for this first batch. It will be presented by Anna Karamat from DG Environment. And the topic is Natural Capital Accounting, Measuring the bio Biodiversity Footprint of Products and Organization. This is much needed for the transformation that we all have a ahead of it. Anna, are you online for the presentation? The floor is yours. Yes, hello, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear. Now we can oh, okay. even see you, so that's best. Okay, hello, good morning, everybody. Um, okay, so um, this um, is about natural capital accounting. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the policy context. Um, so the EU biodiversity strategy 2030 recognizes that biodiversity considerations need to be better integrated into public and business decision making at all levels. This should include measuring the environmental footprint of products in organizations on the environment complemented by natural capital accounting. So by natural account capital accounting, um, we're talking about uh, businesses um, performance reporting by explicitly identifying impacts or dependencies on natural resources and placing a monetary value on them. This is a very uh, important aspect that we want to stress for this call. Um, the expected uh, outcomes um, so mainstreaming the use of corporate natural capital accounting, integrate biodiversity and ecosystem considerations into business decision making by measuring the biodiversity footprint of products and organizations, improve the corporate biodiversity disclosure through innovative approaches to foster principles of biodiversity data transparency demonstrate innovative solutions for valuing business impacts and dependencies in biodiversity, and explore solutions to decrease the biodiversity footprint of retailers in global value chains. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so in this um, call, what we are looking for, um, we, um, we want to develop in real settings, standardized natural capital accounting practices to support companies to measure value and synthesize biodiversity and ecosystem risks assessment. We contribute to the, to the alignment of natural capital accounting between the public and private sectors, address the obstacles businesses are facing, in particular on data collection and improving the access and utility of European environmental data sets, and develop and test natural capital accounting and reporting frameworks for business performance with respect to biodiversity and ecosystem services reporting, uh, support developing and testing natural capital and biodiversity-based business models, take stock and establish links with the work undertaken by ongoing initiatives, European and national platforms on business and biodiversity. 
and support the practical implementation of corporate reporting obligations, such as under the EU Non-Financial Reporting Directive and the EU Taxonomy on Sustainable Finance. Uh, the indicative budget is um, um, 10 million. Um, a few things uh, that I want to stress that are important for us. So applicants should have a solid understanding of natural capital, capital accounting methods and the ongoing work at EU and international level. In particular here to be mentioned are the EU, is the EU project transparent? Uh, the proposed Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive and the other projects which are referenced in the call. So we would like uh, the, the project proposals to focus on what, what is being done already at the moment and based on this uh, make concrete proposals uh, for future work. Um, we want the proposals really to focus on natural capital accounting and the use of monetized accounting approaches and to pilot and test existing methods. Um, it's also important um, so to ensure that there is a good col collaboration with all the entities that are working in this area and also with um, us in DG Environment and other um, directorates of the Commission that are interested and involved in this work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. Um, now I would like to, uh, if you can bring this next slide. I would like to open um, the Slido for the questions and don't forget to indicate the topic number and I also invite you to upvote any questions you may find interesting. We will take the most popular uh, uh, of course first if we can. Um, so what do we have? We have here uh, our excellent colleagues from the research uh, um, executive agency, REA, who do a great work really in managing all these projects and preparing uh, these info days also. Uh, Colombe, please, you can assign the, um, the topics to the relevant presenters that we had before. Thank you, Philippe. So the first question is um, for you, Ivan, on topic one. The question is the following, is it mandatory for every project to work on both marine and terrestrial biodiversity? And, of, and the second part of the question, why a budget of 40 million would be eligible if two projects are awaited? Ivan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Indeed, also I think it's linked to the third question I see on Slido. Indeed, uh, something like some of budget engineering in this topic. Um, actually, it's not uh, excluding a project um, addressing both uh, terrestrial, aquatic, terrestrial, and uh, marine coastal. It's not excluded. That's why uh, it's the uh, proposal of 14 million could be uh, envisaged. Otherwise, we open the possibility, and we expect we to have the focus on the marine part uh, with a limit of two thirds of the budget, and one project dealing with uh, aquatic terrestrial ecosystem uh, receiving one third of the budget. But it doesn't exclude a proposal to address both at the same time with a full rim of the, of the budget. Or we can propose um, yeah, relevant uh, uh, budget for a lower price and enable other projects to be funded. But uh, there's no exclusion. Thank you. Uh, Anna. Thank you, Ivan. Um, next question is a bit, uh, of course, uh, related. Um, so let's um, maybe move it to in quickly. To which extent is terrestrial biodiversity to be taken into account? For you, yeah, so, so it's, uh, yeah. Uh, so it's terrestrial aquatic biodiversity, where the, the originality is to, to go under the surface and uh, be invited to, to look also at the, at the aquatic uh, Biodiversity threats uh, on uh, on Earth, on the on the ground. Um, same uh, the first question. Uh, the focus of the topic is marine coastal, and the proposal could be focusing only on this, but we will accept proposal addressing both or a proposal standing alone on aquatic 
uh, ecosystem on land will also be uh, eligible, uh, aiming at one third of the budget. I hope it's clear. <laughs> very clear. Thank you very much, Ivan. Let's move on to um, the second topic that was presented by Josefina. Um, Josefina, this question is for you. Um, is a potential consortium free to define a selection process for potential grants to third parties? I think here um, the applicant is referring to the cascading grains that you pre presented. Or are there terms of conditions to be considered? Please, Josefina. Thank you, Colombe. Uh, well, uh, the consortium is free to define the selection process, but uh, within the uh, <laughs> within the uh, the um, uh, public procurement rules uh, and grant cascade grant uh, rules of Horizon Europe. Uh, normally, uh, you need to demonstrate that you have built a selection process that is transparent, that you have made a call for projects or for pilots, and that you have selected them in a transparent way, and you have to um, write in the proposal how, how are you going to avoid conflicts of interest. Um, well, this, this is the general one. But uh, this is the first time that we use cascade, uh, cascade granting in the Horizon Europe, and uh, it would be also good to, to see from the evaluators what are the lessons learned from this exercise. As long as you use transparent and, uh, and uh, fair procedures, uh, this is uh, supposed to be good. I refer you to the, to the terms in the call and to the links that would give you to the legal uh, basis. Thank you, um, Josefina. Uh, we will ha we will have no question on uh, biodiversity number three, so as you were very clear, uh, Tiago. Now on number four, uh, Anna, if you are with us still, uh, are there any measures in, pl in place how the successful consortium should collaborate with the Biodiversity Partnership and the European Knowledge Centre for Biodiversity, which is written in, in, indeed in the work programme? Anna, this question is for you. Uh, yes, no, I think it's for the consortium to propose that, how this uh, collaboration could be done. Um, I could think of um, that um, there would be some kind of steering committee um, where all the involved actors could regularly meet. Okay, um, can you put your camera, or ha is it fine for you, the question now, for, did you answer totally? Yes, thank you, Anna. It's nice to see you. From my side, yes, that was my reply. But if the person who asked the question wants to know more, we can continue the discussion. Okay, there's also if ways to answer to ask questions in the re uh, inquirer research service, of course. Can we have still time for one if question? If I may. I was if about I to give you the floor, that. Josefina. I was about to give you. I never <laughs> forget the partnership. Uh, <laughs> that's why I ask for the floor. Please, you can um, yes. elaborate from your end. The Biodiversity Partnership has started already their activities on the 1st of October, so uh, we expect applicants of this topic to, to leave some resources in some, in some uh, areas for collaboration, and I encourage them to contact the partnership directly to see what are these measures and what, what could be the... the um, the ways of, of collaboration. I also encourage the same for the Knowledge Center, although this is a um, commission body, well, a commission uh, initiative. So uh, all applicants should contact these two to see how, how this collaboration can be done and earmark the necessary resources in the budget and in the work packages of the project, the proposal. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Josefina, for this first um, question and answer. We'll take a last one for you, Ivan, on um, your topic uh, number one. And this question is about the UK. Since UK left the EU, would UK case study sites make sense with regard to WFD and MSDF? Ivan? Yes. Uh, as far as understood, you. because uh, ah, you can't see me? Not yeah. yet. Great. Yes, but it's a general question about uh, participation of UK teams in uh, research in, uh, in the form of programs. So there's no really uh, an issue for uh, specifically for this topic. Um, also, you know, the UK has a strategy for the, its marine water, which are very, very close and similar to the marine strategy framework directive. So there should be no problem to, for the collaboration and to benefit um, uh, for UK teams uh, to the work done uh, within this topic. 
Okay, I think we may have time for a last one, Philippe. Oh, you want to complement? Yes, if I may. Uh, this is true, but uh, I would advise that those who wish to propose activities with the UK or concerning the UK in any way really check on what's the current status of the discussion with the, with the UK and their participation. This is not an easy situation. It has no precedent. Um, and, and the negotiations are going on. Uh, but uh, it's very difficult to give a definite answer at this stage. And uh, I would advise that when the proposals are being prepared, these issues are checked at that moment. Yeah. Uh, Yes, uh, we'll take one more on estuaries. So, t again for you, Ivan. Are estuaries under yeah. consideration and more generally the connection between rivers and seas? Yes. Um, no, the focus is because to further resources of the topic going to marine and coastal, uh, because going into underwater in the sea requires much more in uh, devices, uh, which like fleet, uh, deep sea, uh, unmanned vehicles, and much more costly uh, devices. Um, that justification of the resource. But uh, of course, estuaries and shallow parts are completely uh, relevant here to monitor, uh, to, to be uh, covered by the topic. The, the thing is, you can make a proposal, one single proposal to address all aquatic ecosystem with a the focus of two further of the resources going to the marine coastal and one third to aquatic terrestrial based ecosystem. Uh, and then I can reply for, to the second one, the standard, yes, a single proposal for aquatic terrestrial ecosystem is eligible as long as it proposes no more than one third of the capacity of the topic to be to, to fund. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, maybe a last one for this Q&A, the one on carbon sequestration, if you agree, yeah. the carbon sequestration scope would justify a project of its own. To what extent should this be addressed? Of course, it's a contribution. Like, uh, also, we don't expect the topic to develop the models, the new models as well. Uh, here is to provide the new uh, empirical data, thanks to the capacity of, of new in-situ uh, tools and, uh, and the way or to define new proxies to describe better the processes as we start not to understand better how it functions underwater. We still have a lot to discover, maybe even just in terms of species and then their functionalities, but we learn more. And we have some topics funded in previous framework program and <clears throat> in the previous year of this region Europe to develop the knowledge on uh, marine ecosystem uh, component uh, different biodiversity threats and processes that will help to inform uh, what we have to look at to better understand and then ultimately to provide the data for the modelers to, to do a proper ecosystem modeling uh, based uh, with a physical, geochemical and uh, a, more, uh, a more realistic uh, description of what's going on in terms of biological processes. For the carbon sequestration, you have to um, be a contribution to develop this capacity uh, to calculate. So we need to observe and be able to describe and then predict how the carbon cycle, energy, and nutrient transfer are functioning in also in time uh, in time changes, time scale. Thank you very much, Ivan. Um, the last question of is the, the general one. So I will address. Um, I will give the floor to you, Philippe. Please. Yeah. So, uh, indeed, you're well informed, and it's great that you followed the uh, state of the uh, European Union speech of uh, President von der Leyen. Uh, she announced a uh, doubling of uh, the fund. I would not say that there's a risk of duplication of fund. One has to see how those will be uh, allocated from which sources. It is likely, but not yet defined, that some come, will come from Horizon Europe, but most of the funding will come from development cooperation programs, so uh, managed by DG INPA. And uh, the scope of the activities uh, through development programs is quite different from through uh, what is done in research innovation activities. So therefore, uh, we will, of course, avoid that there's a duplication of fund, but overall the in increase, of course, is a very good news. And what we need to make sure of is that the uh, outcomes of research and innovation are being deployed through uh, cooperation, development cooperation policies. And therefore, when we'll know 
uh, how these funds will be allocated, of course, this will be uh, made public uh, and can be used as an element for your proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. I think so. This is the end of the Q&A for this first part of the um, presentation. So now the floor is yours for the next topics. Let's go for batch two of topic presentation. Um, I would like now to listen to topics on managing biodiversity in primary collection. This heading has six topics, so we will do it in two batches, one now and the other one at the end of the session uh, for the two-stage call. After each series of three topics, we will open again the Q&A session through Slido, as we did just before. For the first topic, will be, it will be presented by Gisela Quaglia from DG Agri, and it's about intercropping. Gisela? Thank you. Thank you, Philip. And good morning. So I, I will present the, the topic intercropping, understanding and using the benefits of complexity in farming and value chain. That is a research and innovation action. We can go to the next slide, please. I will start right away with the policy context that the project funded under this topic are expected to contribute to the European Green Deal and notably to the biodiversity strategy and the farm to fork strategy. Gisela, may and I ask you to switch on your camera if I may intervene? It makes it more pleasant to watch. It, it was on. I will do it again. Oh, it doesn't appear on the, on the screen. Now? I'm visible no. now. No. Okay. Then, please, sorry for the interruption. Go on, because the, the content so, is even more important, but it's always pleasant to see you. If we can, we'll restore that. Okay. So, this, this project will promote diversification in agriculture as means to increase the resilience of the sector vis-a-vis -vis variable environmental, climatic, and economic conditions. So, the expected out outcomes of the projects are uh, as follow. The integration of knowledge to better understand, assess, and use ecological processes which underpin the multiple benefits arising from intercropping, to better understanding the barriers for adoption of intercropping by farmers, to increase the availability of field-tested and ready-to-use agronomic practices for intercropping uh, applicable to various conditions across Europe, to increase the evidence and appreciation of the beneficial effects of intercropping and the demonstration of the economic avenues of diversified production for the farming sector and related value change. If we can go to the next slide, I will briefly mention the scope of the, the, the topic. It's quite dense, the, the, the presentation, the slide. I apologize for that, but I, I will highlight a few uh, points. The proposal should study the mechanism that support the benefit associated with intercropping and clarify the links between above and below ground species interaction and how this could be optimized through management. Regarding management, we, we search for to identify, test and demonstrate the agronomic practice that promote benefits from intercropping, in particular by optimizing the interaction between plants, environment and management. We will also like that the project explore farmers' motivation to adopt intercropping practices and propose solutions to overcome these potential barriers and develop guidelines and provide opportunity for practical demonstrations, taking into account a range of farming system, pedoclimatic conditions and value change. Important aspect to consider for this topic, the activities must be implement the multi-actor approach to ensure the adequate involvement of advisor, farmers, other players in the value change and consumer. The result of the activities should benefit both conventional and organic agriculture. International cooperation is strongly encouraged in this topic, in particular with countries where intercropping is widely applied. This topic uh, should include uh, as well the effective contribution of social science and humanity disciplines. The, the indicated budget is uh, 8 million euros per project with a total budget of 16 million euros. Thanks. 
Thank you, Gisela. And we can go to the second topic, um, which is about agrobiology, and will be presented either by Caroline Potier or Susanna Gaona, because the information I received on who will present, I see that the initial of, uh, of um, Susanna, if they appear on the screen, is it Susanna or Caroline Potier? Um, good morning. Uh, I've prepared the presentation. Go ahead, then. This, Go ahead. Uh, and my apologies okay. for the okay. confusion. I had contradictory information. No problem. Good Thank morning, you. Philippe. Good morning, everybody. Um, so, with this topic, uh, monitoring and effective measures for agrobiodiversity, we will support research and innovation actions. Next slide, please. So, this topic um, uh, will support uh, the biodiversity strategy and uh, it is uh, strongly connected with the implementations of the EU Birds and Habitats Directive and with the Common Agricultural Policy. And maybe it is the main message of my presentation, a very good knowledge and understanding of both uh, areas is needed to prepare good proposals uh, for this topic. Um, farmers have a key role in preserving biodiversity, but at the same time, some agricultural practices may lead to biodiversity decline. According to the latest State of Nature report, many terrestrial habitats are severely impacted by agriculture, especially grasslands and freshwater habitats. Today, unfortunately, there are gaps in the data to identify species requirements and to monitor population trends over time for species dependent on agricultural habitat. Um, this hampers the design of appropriate eco agroecological conservation measures and the proper implementation of the directives. This is why we have proposed this topic, uh, with which we expect uh, the following outcomes. Methods and tools for a systemic monitoring of in situ biodiversity of agricultural areas considering above ground and soil biodiversity. Enhanced methods and indicators to evaluate the impact of agricultural practices and in particular CAP agri-environment measures or eco schemes on above and below ground biodiversity. Increased access to information on carbon and nature rich areas more effective farm advisory systems in relation to biodiversity issues. In the longer term, more effective agri-environment measures with an increased uptake of agroforestry measures under rural development programs. Next slide, please. For the scope of this project, of, of the future project, we expect a, a map the, the project to map carbon on nature rich areas and analyze the effects of agricultural practices on biodiversity to monitor the diversity and area of habitats for farmland dependent species in space and time to develop and test effective agro environment measures as well as indicators and monitoring tools to determine the effectiveness of conservation measures for species and their habitats in the agricultural context to develop and demonstrate practical examples of agroforestry systems and how these can be promoted through rural development programs. Activities should be carried out across a range of climatic biogeographical regions. The project needs to take into account already existing European species action plans such as the Total Dove Action Plan and the EU Wet Grassland Water Action Plan. The indicative budget is 8 million euros for one project, uh, and we consider important to have a cooperation with the Biodiversity Partnership and other relevant Horizon Europe missions and partnerships. This is all for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Um, to the audience, feel free to ask questions in Slido.
they are most welcome. We'll have time to address them uh, after. And also the fact that we are uh, switching from presentation from DG Research Innovation, DG Agri, DG uh, Env. This shows the um, outcome of the co-creation process. As you know, or you may know, Horizon Europe is now uh, prepared in full co-creation between the respective DGs and the interface, the links between the research and the policies is much stronger than it used to be. This is all welcome. It's needed for the transformation. It needs to accelerate change. And uh, researchers preparing proposal need to account for that. The way we do research these days evolves, has to evolve, has to accelerate, and be more impactful. This is an important message that should come across in all academic communities, in the private sector, everywhere. The role is to use this research to transform society. Now for the third uh, and last topic of uh, this part, um, we have Michael Wolf from DG Agri uh, presenting a topic on sustainable management of forest genetic resources. Michael, are you online? Yes, thank you, Philip. And Hello, everyone. So I'm, I'm presenting a topic with quite a long title, Protection and Sustainable Management of Forest Genetic Resources of High Interest for Biodiversity, Climate Change and Adaptation and Forest Reproductive Materials. This is a research and innovation action. Next slide, please. So, what uh, we are trying to support is the EU policy, uh, which aims to adapt forests to the new conditions and weather extremes caused by climate change. The diversity of forest genetic resources provides the adaptive potential for tree species and populations to cope with climate change. The adaptive potential of forests depends on the demographic history the forces of natural selection, but it also depends on forestry activities and the choice of the species and populations that show a better potential for adaptation. So what we want to achieve with uh, this topic is to contribute to the following out expected outcomes. Improved cooperation and knowledge sharing on deploying and conserving forest genetic resources in Europe, the better conservation of unique tree lineages for forest ecosystem restoration and management, the sustainable use of genetic resources within the forest community in a climate change context, and the efficient Im implementation of the access and benefit sharing regulation. Next slide, please. So what uh, proposals will do is to conduct research and networking on provenance trials or common guards trials and reassessment of all the provenance tests. They will also evaluate the impact of forestry management on the genetic diversity develop new cultural trajectories to protect and sustainably use forest genetic resources and quantify the ecosystem services provided. They will also focus on methods and strategies to breed forest reproductive material with a higher genetic uh, diversity. What is important here is that the biomass properties essential for wood-based products and related uh, to the resilience to climate change induced disturbances are safeguarded or enhanced. Proposals will also develop methods and tools to expand the production capacity of nurseries and the diversity of forest reproductive material. Uh, an important point is also that they will establish a network of nurseries uh, which are assisting each other with the provision of forest, reproduct forest reproductive material. And last but not least, they will also expand the format, the EU Forest Reproductive Material Information System, 
to provide information on genetic uh, conservation units with useful properties. Important to know, uh, we estimate that the EU contribution of 8 million uh, would allow these outcomes to be addressed appropriately. The total budget is 8 million, so we will have one uh, project. And uh, the proposals need to cover different climate climate and biogeographical regions in Europe. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much for your presentation. Uh, I would like now to uh, go to the next slide with the Slido instructions and invite you to uh, insert your question. Don't forget to indicate the number of the uh, topic that you uh, wish to refer to and we can take uh, the questions as they come. Uh, I don't know if there are many or not. Thank you, uh, Philippe. So the first um, two questions are for you, Gisela, and they are on the topic you just presented. Um, I read the first one. Are activities around feed production for livestock farming included in this topic? And what are about feeding, what about, sorry, uh, feeding value chains? Gisela, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, yes, indeed, the activity, uh, feed production and feeding value chains are uh, not excluded in the, in the scope of the topic, so it can be considered as uh, intercropping uh, systems. And I, I can reply as well the second question that is also related to the topic, to this topic. Um, so the, the focus of the topic is on agro agronomic aspect uh, and the biodiversity angle is um, regarding the speech rich production systems and uh, and it's so, and in, indeed you no know, that diversify farming systems so this this should be the uh, as well uh, um, an aspect to be tackled in the in the proposals uh, from part of the consortiums you? Uh, yes philip you want to add something yeah, if we can put on the screen the question again because i i find it in, in, interesting on how much uh, no, the, the, the previous question that was just... It was how much biodiversity should be included, yeah. Yeah, that's... The, yeah. It's... Sorry? The, the, the point, sorry, the point for researchers is not about making a successful proposal through. <laughs> there is no particular criteria or threshold on the way uh, on how much biodiversity is accounted for. This is a call for research innovation in the area of biodiversity. And of course, we know that by, if, if the biodiversity cr crisis is a major threat to uh, the humanity and to the agri uh, agriculture uh, production uh, in Europe and, and, and worldwide. So therefore, um, I don't know if this proposal uh, this question comes from a researcher but i'm a bit surprised by this type of of, of question uh, biodiversity is essential and what we want for the policies is to make sure that the best scientific knowledge on the importance uh, of biodiversity on the driver of biodiversity loss is uh, reported in the outcomes of this research so therefore policy can be adjusted accordingly and it's not a question of just passing a threshold to be eligible in a proposal, that would not be the right approach, if I may be frank. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you, Gisela. Um, now I will move on to a question addressed to Caroline on uh, the topic you just presented. So what really means longer term? Indeed, in the work program, it is indicated um, long. And what does it mean? How many years uh, are we talking about? If you can take this one, uh, Caroline. Yes, um, I would not uh, speak about years, but maybe about uh, policy cycles. Uh, well, my understanding is that what is meant with this longer term means that it will be difficult to accept uh, to expect uh, impacts on the current uh, uh, 
uh, common agricultural policy, which is started to be implemented, but maybe for the next one, uh, we should expect uh, some impacts. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, there was also a question, a more general question, about how many countries should be represented in a consortium. And that's a general question about uh, the, the different topics, so not a specific one. Should I give you the floor, Philippe, on this one? Yeah. If I know the rules well, uh, there's a minimum, but it's, uh, there's no prescription on the number of partners. But this gives me the opportunity to remind the researchers that uh, fragmenting too much the proposal by involving too many partners is maybe not the most uh, effective way to design a, a program. And uh, by no means the Commission prescribes this. I heard this uh, several times in the past, that we were encouraging large consortium with many partners. This is not true. There are some minimal requirements, and then it is up to the research institutes to decide how many partners they bring on board. They need to have the capacity to digest these amounts, which are not small from, for, for some entities. So it, it has to be credible, realistic, and significant for every partner, because if the money is spread amongst too many partners, the project may not be easy to manage for those, and, and too much energy would be lost actually in the management of the different groups, instead of uh, putting it in the development of the knowledge and the science. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Philippe. A question for you, Michael, uh, about um, the forest topic. So, I read the question to you and I um, give you the flow afterwards. The topic allows new provenance trials to be established. Growing trees needs time. Hence, what length of project lifetime would be acceptable? This is for you, Michael. Yes, thank you very much. And this is a very interesting question. Uh, indeed, we have uh, a big interest to reassess actually um, all the uh, tests already. So we know that there are times, all the time series which should be further analyzed. But at the same time, of course, uh, we also see the need to establish uh, new provenance trials. So we have not identified uh, or defined, uh, 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 let's say, a project uh, lifetime. This will depend on the on the consortium and the plans they have. But of course, uh, it's true that uh, this needs time. So you will have to think about this in in detail to maximize the impact of your project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, very much. Uh, thank you, everybody. May, um, Philippe, uh, that's the end of the questions uh, coming for this uh, Q&A. So thanks to all the speakers. Uh, Philippe, I give you back the floor. A very quick announcement. We will have a break until 12.30 uh, Brussels time, and we'll resume the sessions with the other topics being presented. Thank you. I hope you find it interesting, and have a good break. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Welcome back uh, after the break. I would like to start immediately by um, announcing that we'll have two presentations in a row by Marco Fritz on uh, two topics, one on, well, both topics are addressing enabling transformative change for biodiversity. And we will follow uh, this presentation by a uh, Slido uh, Q&A uh, session. So, Marco, um, I understand you're online. Can you please present us the first topic, which has a very long title. I will not read it out. You can do it yourself. Please, Marco. Many thanks, Philippe. Good morning to everybody. Um, I will indeed present two topics on transformative change in a row, and I will um, give in the first presentation all of the policy context and some um, crossover um, necessary requests to these topics, which are valid for both for the um, topic 1.8 and 1.9. So topic 1.8 um, is on assessing the nexus of extraction, production, consumption, trade and behavior patterns and of climate change action on biodiversity in the context of transformative change. It is a research and innovation action. Um, and it is covering transformative change on biodiversity, which is which we want to do in a portfolio of six topics, four of them which have been already published in the work program 2021. And these two are published in the uh, work program 22. One issue which we want to have from all projects that we are working closely together. Can I have the next slide, please? On the policy context, so transformative change for biodiversity was at the first time very much put on the policy agenda by IPES in its global assessment, but also IPCC and policies such as the Green Deal, the biodiversity, bioeconomy, circular economy and food strategies. We are all asked for understanding the potential and challenges of transformative change for biodiversity loss. And we know that this is, we are at the beginning of understanding them and implementing them into policies. So these projects are doing very much a, a kind of, a, of, of work which we would like that it feeds afterwards into the policies to be developed or to be reviewed with the knowledge and the options, the approaches, the tools, um, how we can uh, tackle indirect drivers for biodiversity loss, which these projects will deliver in their lifetime. So, in short, we want to transformative change to be initiated, accelerated and upscaled, and social innovation, new technologies, production processes and consumption products, behavior changes, trade patterns to be made more biodiversity friendly. I repeat, this is the policy context for the next two projects. The outcomes of this project is, and all of these should be tackled by the um, application, is that we have sustainable pathways which are designed to minimize biodiversity loss or better even to enhance biodiversity, which goes across in particular here, the primary sector, so extraction, production, processing, uh, retailing, trade patterns, consumption, and this goes in the medium term and the long term, which means beyond 2030. But we understand better the human dimensions which impacts biodiversity. So based on ethics, the social context, institutions, organization, the behavior of people. And that should provide, that it provides policymakers, industrial stakeholders and civil society, the tools which could help us to highlight the synergies of biodiversity with climate transitions, and including on how to avoid or minimize trade-offs between climate and biodiversity action. That we understand the social norms and behaviors linked to socioeconomic values, which affect biodiversity, and that transformational change is motivated through learning, co-creation dialogue and based on case studies which can be case studies on good or failed examples. Can I have the next slide please? Thank you. The scope of this project is, as I've said, how primary production activities go along supply chain and how this affects biodiversity. But pathways in particular on this primary production um, can be made, can be put into place to minimize the loss and enhancing biodiversity. But we really know what it's meant with identifying and addressing leverage points for tra transformational change. 
that it includes new business models and it goes also into infrastructure and labor. There are two specific issues we want from this project, means public procurement for delivering biodiversity benefits and nature-based solutions for accelerating transformative change should be examined. And that we look, or that we consult here, the applicants look and engage in understanding and engaging culturally diverse communities that look into behavioral changes, which ones could lead to biodiversity-friendly production consumption patterns. How can biodiversity be put into integrated assessment models and how what is the relevance of transition pathways for biodiversity so it's a, a complex topic an ambitious topic but we expect that these topics really bring us further in the policy on this one the budget for this um, um, topic is 12 million euros so we expect uh, we recommend more or less 3 million euro per project what is important and that is again important for both of the projects to come, that both should very much contribute their knowledge to the Knowledge Center for Biodiversity and the Science Service for Biodiversity, which is at this moment set up. For both, you find information on the web. If you Google them, you find more information. The Knowledge Center is set up since a year. The Science Service is to be set up next, but you find a fact sheet which explains you further on how the Science Service should work. We, we expect that these projects work together, which I've said already before, with resources and time dedicated to this. It needs multidisciplinary research and social sciences and humanities industry and stakeholders to be included. And the case studies, as I've said, failed a good examples, which could be on land and on sea. And this project, less the other one, is um, earmarked for international cooperation, so we would welcome international cooperation in the consortia and in um, the way how this project is, is tackled and carried out because the phenomena we have seen in the scope are of course europe-wide and globally important thank you if i can get the next slide i go directly to the next topic thank you this is possibly the topic with a record on the title length so it is on understanding the role of behavior, gender specifics, lifestyle, religious and cultural values, and addressing the role of enabling players and where they are listed in decision making. It's again a research innovation action in the same part on transformative change. Next slide, please. You see in the slide on the left side, the policy context, which I've already um, given. So I go directly to the expected incomes of this topic. It should inform approaches tackling biodiversity loss and implementing nature-based solutions that consider really very much on the social, social aspects, how behavior, lifestyle, religious, societal, cultural values shape the choices of producers and consumers, institutions and their policy decisions, always in the context of biodiversity. But the more that we know what is behind these broad social challenges and transitions which are taken up in the design of relevant policies, communication and engagement campaigns and other actions and can be used for them. What are the leverage points in both sectors which have the greatest impact on biodiversity? And how can we be addressed when we know that the de decisive actors do their different consultations? How can they be influenced? What is relevant for biodiversity from civil society, education institutions, policymakers, financing and business leaders, or retailers is a very important group there. Now that includes very much, of course, human rights and due diligence across the economic value change, as well as the role of employment in just transition, again, linked to biodiversity. And it improves the understanding of the biodiversity interlinkage that we can not really see on this there um, between the different SDGs. So how can the diff then if the different SDGs need to be implemented, what is the role on biodiversity on it? Can I have the next slide, please? And this is the last one. Thank you. So the scope of it is should engage with civil society organizations, with social partners, policymakers, financing, industry and business leaders, retailers and value-led institutions to address these enabling players for transformative change for biodiversity actions. And that could be exemplified in the project by the case studies from local to global levels. It should identify and test measures to overcome this barrier for this behavior change, something we are grappling with since a long, long time 
on biodiversity action, including ethical questions in behavioral economics, links to the future generations. So it means what do we need to do now that future generations have a good life? It would, would need to look at intersectionality approaches and systems of power between gender and other categories and identities, and you find a whole list there. It should look at the importance of engineered versus haphazard policy making factors. So what can really be influenced? What do we know from policy economics and policy behavior studies is more uh, haphazard that the right person is at the right place in the right time. So really to give guidance and, and, and options on how to specify and address the effects of processes affecting adherence to democracy, voting campaigns, science, denialism, impacting biodiversity. We had this not very much in biodiversity in the past, but we expect to come very much when biodiversity is playing a, a, a stronger role in, in decisions uh, to come. So, so the indicative budget of this, um, of this projects which should come out of these topics are three to four million. So we have 10 million in total means we would have possibly up to three topics. But, it, but you see now on the important section, I've already said on the earlier project, many things. Thank you, Marco, for these uh, two clear presentations. And uh, you have also a third uh, topic of a different nature uh, in this uh, part. It's about support to policies and uh, the cooperation with the uh, Convention on Biodiversity, if I'm not mistaken. Could you present this one as well? And then we'll go to the Q&A. I will do. So this um, topic, which is the uh, 220110 on cooperation with the Convention on Biological Diversity, is a coordination and support action. So it should support um, the EU and its member states in working with the Convention on, 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 the, C on the CBD, which how I will um, now say it in the following slides. If you can have the next slide, please. So the policy context is very similar. So we had a number of um, science policy interfaces like IPES and IPCC, uh, which have already very much made clear that there is a need of a better science policy linkage um, for biodiversity at global action, global level, and that goes as well to the policy from the EU. And the EU policy in the EU Green Deal and its biodiversity strategy has very made clear that we are ready to engage further responsibilities for the global biodiversity action. So what we would need here is how can we strengthen the science or research um, input into these actions, into the um, building and in the implementing and monitoring of these of his actions, or on how to inspire how they can be, um, be built further. So we know that there has been already, and there are a number of, um, there have been already some initiatives and there are a number of um, um, working um, patterns in place with projects which are linked to the subsidiary bodies to the CBD, where the EU is, is part of, and, and these common support actions should help that the EU can really better mobilize the research the EU is having and is done in the EU to support these processes at international level. So the expected outcomes of this uh, common and support action is that we have a tool which helps us for better the scientific and technical cooperation of the EU and the associated countries of uh, Horizon, Horizon Europe, which you will find in a uh, in a list which is which you can see um, in the uh, Horizon uh, Europe um, uh, uh, basic um, information, how we can better support the Convention on Biological Diversity in its working groups and task forces through researchers. That has been not been done systematically in the past by the EU and its member states. So, and that means explicit support for respective subsidiary bodies. Um, where we can, where input into science-based processes is um, requested too. Uh, I, I, need, I will make one more explanation here. The issue is here that the um, running processes in the um, CBD are ongoing. But of course, there's one thing we are all expecting, which should be adopted very soon, which is the uh, post-2020 biological fra uh, framework for, for biodiversity. So that should have been already adopted, will now be adopted in 
uh, possibly in April next year, and where the, the topic which would need to refer to it would need to um, build on what we know already, what has been discussed in the in the different discussions um, up to this um, adoption of this framework, and for the rest, we, we, we talk, the um, application would need to play with um, placeholders. So what we really want to have is to have also an improved coherence in how the UN associated countries contribute to the CBD and also to EPAS processes, because both are often in the member states um, a bit not very much connected to each other. And we would like to want to have a, a, a better um, coherence between both and therefore this common support action should help to generate the knowledge which helps the policy makers and the negotiators to make this coherence. That means that we would need to have a back office support, background analysis and synthesis from research for the EU team on negotiating biodiversity aspects at UN level, including during the intersessional periods and capacity building for researchers which should fit in into these UN processes. Can I get the next slide, please? But so it is again to 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 what you said is to to highlight that we really want a, a dedicated mechanism, a tool for this um, scientific and technical cooperation with the EU and associated countries with the CBD. And there will be an informal advisory group for technical and scientific cooperation that is not yet finally adopted by the CPD, but again, there's a lot of things are already known by the SAPSTA and SBI um, and decisions and discussions, so the, the topic could very much it should very It should work together with the Knowledge Centre for Biodiversity, where it delivers on the European technical and knowledge contribution to the Global Biodiversity Platform for Biodiversity and support the implementation of the CBD monitoring framework. So that is done through the Knowledge Center for Biodiversity. But this um, topic should help the Knowledge Center to look at what are the knowledge gaps, how can they be filled, what, how can it collaborate with the EU and national monitoring initiatives and, for example, the Biodiversity Indicators Partnership. It should look at improving biodiversity knowledge to better understand gaps in the global biodiversity action and possibly to help the policymakers how the needs to stepping this up to ratcheting up these biodiversity commitments and action in a few years can be um, um, tackled and it should share the relevant information so that the EU can lead and cooperate on this research which includes targeted capacity buildings for central and eastern European and associated countries. The budget is 5 million euro for this uh, topic. Um, I have already mentioned the Knowledge Center for Biodiversity, so it should work with that together. It should also work with the Science Service. Information can be found on the web for the Science Service. What is the role of the Science Service once it will be operational next year? It should cooperate with other projects relevant here. It should very much capitalize on results of past projects and initiatives, also of running projects at this very moment. Of course, not to um, double um, start any initiatives which are already working, but put them together. This project, this topic is open for international cooperation, very clearly due to the um, um, character of its um, scope. And what is also important that we, any applicants should already give in their application a proposal for actions in the year one, which is relevant and timely to the negotiation agenda at international level, so the project can deliver very, very rapidly. Many thanks. Thank you, Marco, for this detailed explanation uh, on the CBD. You know so much, and we <coughs> expect so much uh, as well. We look forward to seeing these proposals coming. Uh, I would like, if you can show the next slide, please, now. I would like to uh, invite you to place your question on Slido, please indicate the topic uh, number if you wish to ask a question about a specific topic. And uh, I'm ready to take up the first questions or allocate them. Um, thank you, Philippe. So, Marco, there's a question for you on the first topic on transformative change that you presented. Will it be sufficient if a proposal focuses on only one of the primary production sectors mentioned in the topic text? Can you take this one, please?
Yes, thank you for the question. Um, the topic text very clearly says that it should, the topics should address all of the following outcomes um, of, this, of this topic. And that means um, that it should look at, at different ones. So it is not only on one of them. No, it's very clearly that it looks at, um, that it should look at all of them. Thank you. So because it says, assess how attraction, production, processing, consumption, trade, behavior patterns linked to primary production. And there it gives examples like livestock, including food daily coupling from consumption all along supply chains, integrated food system and transformative changes towards climate neutrality, affect biodiversity and ecosystem services. Um, it doesn't say you could select one, but you should select a number of them to go for the uh, transformative change, which is not, which is interlinked in all of them. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Marco. Um, there's another question on the third topic that you presented. Um, I will read it. Should the local policy level also be considered and or addressed via the technical support? Local governments are recognized more, but not in the call text. Can you precise this, please? Thank you um, for the question. So it is up, it is really, that is very much up to the consortia, to the applicant to make proposals. Um, how the outcome of this project can be best achieved if the consortia is of the opinion that it can be done through local governments when the consortia is free to do that. There is no um, request to do otherwise. So that is very much what we can say here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. You are very clear. That's the only questions we have for you. So I wanted to thank you and maybe address um, uh, another question that we received to Philippe, uh, our moderator. And it's about the advice to keep the consortia small. Could you please give us some indication how the European Commission wants uh, proposals to involve stakeholders and target groups? It's a general question for all topics, obviously. So I don't know if I'm a moderator or if I'm triggering questions, <laughs> actually. Um, so my former intervention there was not to advise to keep the consortia small. That's not what I meant to say. It's to ensure that the researchers prepare a consortium that they can manage and provide them with a significant amount of money per, con, con, uh, per participant. Because we heard in the past some frustrated uh, participants who said the amount of money was not worth the participation, but it's them who decided to uh, organize a consortium in this way. So the Commission is not prescriptive about the size of the consortium except a minimum that are in the rules, three partners if I'm not mistaken, but uh, that, that is a low number. And for the rest it's up to those, the, uh, up to the proponents. And again, uh, the indication on how the EC want proposal to involve the EC is not prescriptive. You have the liberty to choose what you prefer, what is the most relevant, what is the most impactful, and the impacts, of course, need to be uh, carefully considered while preparing the proposal. It's the EC is not prescriptive on this. The call is meant to say what we need as progress in, in uh, knowledge and, and uh, or advices even to policies, but we are not pre prescribing the way this should be organized by the consortium. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Philippe. Um, there's no more questions on that, so I think we can close this um, session. Thank you, Marco, for your interventions, and I give you back the floor. Thank you. Then we'll move on to the uh, last element, but not least, of course, uh, to introduce the last series of presentation for the two-stage calls. So the two-stage two calls have the same deadline for application for the first, but as uh, they are called two-stage calls, there is a second deadline uh, afterwards. So it's a different process. It, it means that the first proposal is shorter than what applicants to a one-stage call uh, will submit. Uh, 
We'll, we'll have three topics under the heading Managing Biodiversity in Primary Production. And we will, after, uh, open the uh, last uh, Q&A session through uh, Slido as before. For the first topic, we have uh, Vujadin Kovacevic from DG Environment, uh, who will present us a topic about pollinators and their services. You can see me. Uh, so this topic is about uh, contribution to the uh, tackling the decline of pollinators in agricultural landscapes. The policy context is given at the global level by the, of course, CBD, Convention of Biological Diversity, and uh, EBES, uh, of course, the Science Policy Interface, which in 2016 uh, launched a big report, which is basically state of the art in terms of uh, knowledge on pollinators. And, uh, of course, uh, I would also add the FAO International Pointers Initiative. Uh, at the EU level, uh, EU Green Deal, its flagship initiatives, EU Biodiversity Strategy, uh, Farm to Fork Strategy, and, of course, specifically EU Pollinators Initiative within that framework, are all looking how to tackle this challenge, which is global and EU challenge. And uh, all these initiatives are quite clear that one of the major causes of pollinators decline is uh, agriculture, intensive agriculture, and in some areas also uh, farmland abandonment. Uh, all these, we can call them pollinator friendly policies. Uh, I mean, they need tools uh, to actually to achieve the objective. What we need is a farming system, which is, of course, sustainable uh, and which is productive. So the key remark there would be that we need all actors on board uh, to minimize the pressures uh, on agricultural ecosystems and that we need to do it in a systemic way uh, at the landscape level. This is why uh, this key word in the title of the topic. What do we expect uh, from such systematic uh, landscape level action? Well, we hope that the pollinator uh, habitats or the, uh, the areas, agricultural areas, uh, are thriving in uh, pollinators, both in species richness and uh, species abundance, which will ensure the pollination service. Uh, we hope that this can be achieved and that it is expected to achieve through co-design uh, practices, uh, which are innovative uh, in their nature, which are taken at the wider scale. We are looking at, uh, especially in the socioeconomic uh, aspects of these actions, uh, that we already have uh, guidelines uh, from the EPES report, from the International Pointers Initiative, which is implemented by the FAO. There are also guidelines at the EU level. In terms of recommendation, what needs to be done, we need to test these uh, recommendations, and this is also what this topic is expected to do. Uh, systematic approaches uh, should be demonstrated at different governance levels. We know that we need to tackle problem at different scales. Uh, as I mentioned, the farm, farming viability and profitability is a key aspect. We need to deliver agricultural landscapes in a state that deliver both for nature or biodiversity, in this case pollinators, as well as uh, for those who use the landscape. Uh, as it's a systematic approach, there will be uh, a need for coordination uh, and also underpinned by the very good data and information system. Uh, this kind of system will allow us uh, to go for an ad adaptive management so that we can uh, see quite quickly the changes that we are doing through these large scale uh, activities and, of course, adjust it, correct it uh, as needed. And, of course, CAP measures, CAP tools, especially result based payment systems will play an important role uh, there. Next slide, please. So, what we are looking in terms of, uh, of the activities. Uh, large-scale restoration of other communities uh, uh, in order to drive the systematic mainstreaming uh, into the relevant policy, especially the common agriculture policy, but also other uh, mentioned EU-level policies. Uh, of course, we need to address all the relevant risks in those areas and build capacity, of course, of the actors to act. Uh, in terms of the stakeholders, actors, uh, it's a systematic approach, which means that we need to ensure that farmers are on board, nature conservation sectors on board, consumers, uh, that there is uh, knowledge sharing, which is being facilitated in order to uh, support uh, development and implementation of restoration frameworks. Uh, 
extension services farm and advisor services will play a crucial role here. We need to ensure that this uh, chemistry link between the farmers and uh, and of course conservation communities is uh, well established. Uh, those plans should be also plans for the research and should be addressed with, with the wider communities. And of course, the result should be a guaranteed non reversibility We are here building a systematic approach in the long term, continuation, replication, further wide scaling. And of course, it's critical to assess uh, innovative incentive mechanisms of the socioeconomic aspects, uh, especially in the reduction uh, of the harmful subsidies to basically motivate farmers, incentivize farmers, other land managers to act in the interest of pollinators and their own long term uh, business viability. We are looking uh, at three projects with a total budget of 20 million euros. Uh, so each project uh, indicatively 6 to 10 million euros. And of course, since there will be many projects, we, uh, we encourage, we expect collaboration with them over the overlapping areas, but also contribution to the Knowledge Center for Biodiversity and Science Services. Uh, and just to mention that, yes, more than 50% of budget is expected to go for uh, restoration and the land purchase and lease is not eligible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vujarin. Uh, let's go to the next presentation that will be given by Susanna Gauna Saez from DG Agri. And this innovation action will is titled Boosting Breeding for a Sustainable, Resilient and Competitive European Legume Sector. Susanna. Thank you, Philippe, and good afternoon uh, to you and everybody. So I'm uh, going to present in this, this topic, uh, Boosting Breeding for a Sustainable, Resilient and Competitive European Legume Sector, which is an innovation action. So uh, this topic is really going to address uh, the lack of breeding efforts and the insufficient use of genetic resources of legume crops, which can con be considered partially at least responsible for the low percentage of arable land currently used for legumes in, in Europe, despite the uh, big amount of agronomic and environmental benefits of these crops. So, indeed, for the policy context, uh, as you can see, well, uh, the objective is to really contribute to the uh, farm to fork and biodiversity strategies objectives for a transition to a fair, healthy and resilient EU agricultural sector, notably the objective of uh, fostering uh, EU-grown plant proteins, also in line with the report on the development of uh, plant proteins in the European Union, already published by the Commission in 2018. Uh, concerning the expected outcomes, the selected projects are expected to contribute to all of them. Uh, what I'm going to present here, what you can see on the slide, is just a snapshot of, uh, of the outcomes. I really encourage you to really read the text of the topic because it was not possible to include everything here. So uh, the projects are expected to improve legume varieties for different attributes and traits, also to improve the availability of and open access to data on breeding methods and legume breeding research outcomes. Uh, achieve increased competitiveness of the legume breeding sector, improve biodiversity and diversification of farming systems and agri-food value chains, and increase farmers' competitiveness, and last but not least, improve delivery of environmental services from agriculture, thanks to more uh, cultivation of legume crops uh, in the EU. So, in the next slide, you will be able to uh, see again a snapshot of the activities. Again, I advise you to really refer to the topic text for all the details on the, uh, what is really being asked from the, for the projects. So, uh, projects are expected to develop measures to improve legume varieties for a wide range of attributes, to improve screening techniques to do that, to analyze the cost effectiveness of breeding methods, and also to identify the best varieties that are suited for different uses to analyze examples of innovative engagement of value chain actors, and also to develop inclusive governance and financial models. So it's a, a lot about uh, um, uh, collaboration among the different stakeholders, as you may see. Uh, the projects are also expected to design training packages as, as addressed to the different actors, to set up a transdisciplinary Europe-wide pl platform to facilitate the transnational and transregional knowledge and best practices sharing among breeding initiatives, Important is also that the projects foster demonstration and testing of legume breeding with emphasis in those regions where the legume breeding sector is less developed across Europe. 
It's also important to uh, pay attention to develop a catalog of legume species and varieties that are an open repository of breeding methods and breeding research outcomes. And last but not least, important to take into consideration that the project should address the needs of the conventional agroecological and organic sectors in all European climate and biogeographical regions. Uh, well, so we have uh, well, the indicative budget for this topic is 14 million euro. In total, uh, expected uh, amount for project 7 million euros. So, in principle, we are able to uh, fund two projects. Important uh, considerations for the for the applications is that this is a multi-actor uh, project. So, it means that the projects must uh, demonstrate a genuine involvement of the end users and all other actors uh, of the value chain in all stages of research. This is an eligibility criteria. It's also important that the projects build on results of previous or ongoing uh, EU-funded projects and also to ensure collaboration collaboration with other projects, with the projects that are funded actually under this topic. So this is uh, also very important. It's also important to note that international cooperation for this topic is strongly encouraged. And last but not least, that the TRL expected at the end of the activities is between six and seven. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this presentation, Susanna. And uh, I don't know if uh, those who listen are already hungry or are already eating as we talk about legumes, uh, but if you have an appetite for uh, filing in a question, feel free to do so on Slido. Uh, we will answer it after the next presentation, which is the last one uh, for uh, this part of the Info Day, and the presentation will be given by Valerio Abadessa from DGAGRI, and it's on resilient beekeeping. Valerio? Thank, thank you very much, and uh, well, good afternoon, we can say, everybody. So now we are addressing the, the, the topic on uh, resilient beekeeping, which is a research and innovation action. And the next slide, please. So the policy context, why? Well, uh, you know that bees and honeybees are important components of agriculture, of sustainable agriculture, and also of uh, food security. And they are essential not only for the environment, but also for the economy of rural areas. But uh, uh, unfortunately, the honeybee sector is under stress since many years ago due to the uh, intensification of agricultural practices or the use of pesticides as well as climatic changes and globalization. So despite uh, there are great progress in research innovation, there are still gaps in our understanding on how the different stressors can affect uh, bees and also on the interaction between stressors, biotic and or uh, abiotic stressor. So which are the uh, expected outcomes? Well, improve the resilience of beekeeping against stresses, uh, nutritional pathogens and others, which imply a sort of a system approach, uh, such as a, a better knowledge of honeybee immunity and uh, uh, nutrition, an improved capacity to deal with uh, pathogens, and uh, a better understanding of honeybee population diversity, and also of the impacts on, uh, on wild uh, pollinators. And next slide, please. So the scope, uh, well, how this topic? Well, the topic must uh, uh, develop equipment or technology and uh, management practices that can be used for climate change adaptation and mitigation, and they might depend on, on local condition. Must perform studies on immunity, health, uh, nutrition, genetic diversity, and also resistance of honeybees. Uh, must develop tools uh, to assess the impacts of uh, beekeeping on pollinators, and also tools and strategy to uh, mitigate those impacts and help uh, decision makers. Address the varroic destructor at least, which is one of the biggest problem in uh, beekeeping worldwide today, and possibly other honeybee mites, uh, which means also review the biological mechanism of varroa and its potential uh, uh, interaction with other pathogens, and uh, identify new uh, control methods, including bee genetic uh, resistance. And finally, assess the uh, last but not least, let's say, assess the 
vulnerability and preparedness of the sector in relation with regard to uh, Athena Tumida and uh, uh, also uh, Tropile Labs. So analyze also strategies and practices in other countries, also outside Europe, and suggest uh, mitigation strategies for uh, beekeepers. The indicative budget is 12 million. Uh, two projects are intended to be funded, one on abiotic factors and the other on biotic factors. And what is important is that if appropriate, uh, genetic components should be taken into account, uh, looking at the diversity of uh, honeybee population, as I mentioned before, and also breeding and conservation approaches to address the, the, the challenges already, already mentioned. And finally, the uh, multi actor approach, as we have heard also before, I mean, it's important, it's an eligibility criteria. So the stakeholders, several stakeholders from beekeepers, farmers, advisory services, et cetera, must be involved since the beginning and the objectives of the, of the project must target the needs and also provide opportunity to uh, end user. So with this, I thank you again for your attention and good luck for, for your proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valerio. And this was the last presentation. We can now go to the last Q&A session on Slido. If you want to address a specific topic, please specify the number. If not, general questions are still uh, allowed. Uh, I don't know. Um, Colomb, is there? Thank you, Philippe. Yes, there are um, two questions for um, you, Susanna, on the topic you presented. So I read them loud. Is this topic targeting livestock farming systems and animal feed value chains? And can startups apply? Thank Susanna, you, Colomb, yeah. and thank you also. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you for the question, also to the participants. Well, the, uh, as you may see in the topic text, there is no uh, explicit reference to the livestock sector or, or, or any specific uh, focus on that. But of course, uh, it says that it should address the wide range of legume varieties used as crops, and this includes for food and also feed. So I think the factor it can be uh, considered that it's, it's uh, addressed or it's included, uh, the livestock farming uh, systems. And in terms of whether startups can apply, I would say yes. I mean, you need to be, of course, part of the a consortia, larger consortia, and also ensure that the end users are, are involved in, the, uh, in all the research activities. So I wouldn't see why you cannot apply. Philip, please. On the application of startups, uh, yes, if I recall well, there are some uh, economic or financial uh, conditions that uh, participants need to meet. And startups, as you know, uh, they are very dynamic, very enthusiastic, but they are short of funds uh, and, and reserves. So there I would advise to check what are the conditions for um, uh, the financial conditions for the participation as partner. But of course, startups are welcome, and I hope that these conditions have improved because we need the startups to change society and be impactful. Thank you. Thank you for the, this compliment. Another question for you, Susanna. Why are pure. Uh, sorry, what? Yes, yeah, sorry, I need this one. But I, I, if I remember well. Uh, uh, Okay, it was, it, it was a question about the fact that it was really targeting agriculture products. And the question, I think, if I understood it well by the applicant was why this is funded under this destination one and not more generally about agri. Probably mm -hmm. you can take that one. Yeah, um, yeah I saw, I saw the, the question in, in Slido and in the, indeed it is funded from agri budget, this topic. And uh, the reason, I mean, you know, legume crops, what they are, of course, they, uh, they are crops, of course, it's a pure, uh, purely uh, agricultural, agricultural sector, but of course, it, it also means, you know, that legume crops have, have a, uh, can provide a wide range of ecosystem services, uh, including also preservation and, and enhancement of biodiversity. So if by uh, improving breeding in, uh, of legume crops, and uh, tapping on the potential genetic resources of legume crops, we can contribute also to those uh, objectives. I don't see the problem why uh, uh, this topic cannot be in this because it's really contributing to, uh, to the objectives of the biodiversity strategy.
But just to, to confirm that it's, it's, bad, it's founded by, uh, by AGRI, actually. Because there was a question clear, yeah. from the participant. Thank you, Susanna, for indeed ex explaining that uh, very clearly. Another question for you. Um, is it expected to include smart agriculture as part of enhancing competitiveness of the sector, or is it only focused on plant breeding? Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, the topic is focused on, on plant breeding and on legume breeding, because as you may know, this is one of the main challenges of legume crops uh, in Europe. There are, there are several others, as you may be aware, but breeding, the lack of breeding efforts in these specific uh, crops is, is one of the reasons why uh, these crops are not more competitive or we don't have more uh, EU agricultural land under, under legume crops. Uh, so this is addressing one this specific problem, but of course, with the lens of making it uh, a more competitive sector. And if you are interested specifically in the competitiveness of protein crops uh, at large, of which legume crops is part of, uh, we have had other topic in uh, 2021 in the first World Program of Horizon Europe, addressing specifically this aspect of achieving or developing more competitive and sustainable protein crop systems and value chains, of which legume crops are also part of. But yeah, this topic is explicitly addressing the needs of the breeding sector for legume crops. Yep. To complement this, ans this answer, there will be a partnership, a research innovation partnership of, called Agriculture of Data. Uh, and I would invite also those uh, interested in smart ag agriculture to look at uh, other intervention areas, uh, notably on environmental observation, where uh, these uh, activities can be uh, funded from as well. Thank you for this compliment, Philippe. Thank you um, very much, Susanna. Um, the next question is addressed to you, Valerio, and I will read it. Does a proposal have to specify whether it is applying with focus on biotic or abiotic stressors? Are both possible? How should ranking take place? There are multiple questions here. Is adaptation to climate change considered as abiotic stressor? Please, Valerio, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for the information. Uh, yes, well, as I mentioned before, I mean, uh, we we think to uh, fund two projects, one on ab abiotic and the other on biotic um, stress or factors. Uh, could be possible, I mean, that the proposal uh, might wish to address uh, uh, abiotic and bi uh, biotic factors or stressors. But obviously, it depends uh, on the on the how the proposal is formulated. I mean, uh, within the abiotic factors, it is also climate change is there, and nutrition, management, etc. So I don't, I'm not going to list all the, the factors. And in the other cases, in biotic structure, we are talking about, we are thinking, we are talking about uh, well, mainly pathogens. So. Uh, Obviously, the same proposal could address both aspects, both stre all stressors, but uh, it would be better, I mean, to our aim uh, to concentrate in two different kind of proposal on, on different stressors. And the, the scope that you, you, you see in the text and also in the slide I, I mentioned before, I mean, the proposal uh, does not need to address all the uh, research activities mentioned there. But depending if it is uh, uh, focusing on biotic or abiotic stressor, can address different uh, uh, activities and different scopes. So it's quite open. So it's up to the consortium how to uh, address the topic. Thank you very much, Valerio. And uh, now uh, we, will we will take some more general questions. So I will address them to Philippe on involving previous projects under the same or similar topics, and I think you're referring to the topics that have been or that are currently evaluated, the one that we are doing in 2021. Will the European Commission establish contact to relevant projects and how will the clustering activities work? Will this count as project activities, time and uh, budget associated? 
So I think the question is about the clustering in general. Should that be part of the proposal, if I understand it well? Uh, yes, I can probably answer to part of the question uh, only. Uh, because the clustering is part of the management of the project undertaken by the research and executive uh, agencies. Uh, to establish the contact to relevant projects, uh, I, I don't think it's the role of, uh, of the Commission. The researchers know well uh, who are their peers, peers who are uh, the other partners that could be involved. But with regard to the formation of the clusters, um, maybe the executive agency can uh, complement this? Thanks. Indeed, so um, for the um, clustering activities, the, there are two options. Either it is clearly indicated in the, call, uh, in, the, in the call itself, so this is something that you should foresee, and it is indeed an added value to have it already in your proposal. And generally, uh, the research executive agency tries to foster all these clustering activities. Those are part of what we call dissemination and uh, exploitation of results. And this is co-organized with the different projects during the time frame of the, of the project implementation. So it's difficult to answer by a straight answer, but definitely um, what I wanted to say is that clustering activity is something that we do foresee. And indeed, if uh, one topic from 2021 is also um, complemented in, tw in 2022, this is something that you should uh, have in uh, take into consideration. If I, if I may compliment. From a policy perspective, the outcome of clustering events that have been organized by the executive agency is much appreciated. So therefore, you, if you as a researcher, <laughs> you want to be impactful on the policies, since there are, I think, more than 10,000 projects in Horizon uh, uh, running, it's impossible to follow every one of them. And if we want to make sure that the transfer of knowledge from the research community to the policymakers is effective, through the clusters, this is a, a good way forward. An investment uh, in this area and also a budget and therefore human resources as well uh, may be a good idea. Thank you, Philippe. Um, a question from, for you, uh, Vuyadine, on the um, topic you presented on pollinators. Uh, is data on biodiversity considered in that Sorry, is data on biodiversity considered in data and information systems? Can you please repeat the additional funding options on data that are available? Vuyadin, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, as long as I understand the question, uh, I mean, we are looking, uh, I'm not sure if I understand it correctly, uh, fully, but uh, we are looking for improved coordination, uh, not only in terms of the governance, but also in terms of data accessibility, uh, financing and maintenance. Uh, of course, the different agreements uh, of actions which are beneficial of pollinators. Data is part of those activities. There are no, uh, basically, uh, any additional options uh, uh, pertinent to the, to the data uh, uh, collection itself. Uh, it should be part of the activities as a whole. Uh, so I I'm not sure if I understood it correctly, but uh, I hope that uh, clarification is uh, sufficient. I think you were clear in if um, the applicant has still some um, doubts or questions, um, he or she can use uh, the uh, research inquiry service and the written question will be addressed to him or her. Yes, I mean, data monitoring and data is part of the act project activities, not going beyond those activities. I hope that clarifies. Thank you, uh, Vuyadin. And then I have a question that is addressed under the topic 03, so it should be for you, Valerio, but maybe it's, it's also not only on this specific topic, but I, I, I will ask it to you now. Is building on previous EU-funded projects considered important under your topic, and is it possible that the proposal does not address all points present in the call? Valerio? Thank you very much. Well, the, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, well, the second question I already answered before. Uh, yes, it is possible not to address all the points. Uh, for this reason, we made a distinction between biotic and abiotic stressors. Obviously, the 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 the, the, well, the, the border is a borderline because maybe some sometime uh, uh, there might be some overlaps. But I mean, the idea is that uh, 
proposal should focus one on one of the two types of stressors. With regard to the previous funded projects, well, it's not written in the text, but by default, I mean, it's obvious that, uh, I mean, a proposal should build on uh, what is the, the state of art or research on this topic could be on uh, at European level, international level, and even at national level. So uh, it's important also to take into account from the projects. This part is not uh, required, but it's a normal procedure, I think. Thank you. Another question for you, uh, Valerio. How are the different yep. aspects weighted in, in, the, in the proposal? A focus on biotic uh, stressors such as climate change and, I, and uh, abiotic stressor is ignored and is poor nutrition considered as an abiotic stressor? Okay, well, I, uh, I don't think here we are to, to, the, to, to make a, a clarification on abiotic and biotic uh, stress. So, well, um, uh, biotic stress so refer mainly to uh, living organisms. So, biotic stress so include uh, uh, pathogens, virus, fungi, uh, harmful insects, etc. While abiotic sectors of uh, stress or factors. Uh, uh, refer to uh, the impact on non-living factor on the organism. So it's up to you to uh, see which factors you want to address uh, in the proposal. How the different aspects will be weighted? Well, the, 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 according to the proposal, if the proposal is dealing with uh, uh, all type of stressor or concentrated more on biotic or abiotic stressor, will be the evaluators that will define how uh, the proposal well, will, will be judged and evaluated, and then they will define a ranking list. And from the ranking list, well, the first proposal will be will be funded as usual. Nothing nothing new, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Valerio. I give you back the floor. Philippe, that's the end of the questions for this specific session. Thank you, Colombe. Uh, so, to conclude, a few very short messages. I hope this session was informative for you, it will help you in preparing the proposals, and I wish to reiterate that this session is meant to provide explanation uh, clarification, if need be, on the call formulation, but the only text that has really uh, uh, value uh, is the call formulation itself. The explanation provided by the colleagues are, uh, we hope, helpful, but do not change the reference, that is, the call text, and this needs to be repeated probably uh, several times to avoid uh, misunderstanding. I wish to thank all the speakers for their presentation and you, the audience, for attending the session and asking all these questions that were quite relevant. As stated in the beginning, the unanswered questions will be addressed after the info days through the Research Inquiry Service. And you can also contact the frequently asked questions and contact your national contact point for more guidance. This last element is very important. You have perhaps near to you, national contact points that can be contacted, should be contacted to get advices on the pre preparation of these proposals because it's a time-consuming exercise. Those are big projects and uh, very interesting, but every researcher should know what he engages in while preparing a proposal. We wish you best uh, and a lot of pleasure in preparing these proposals and look forward to receiving them for the evaluation and bring forward the knowledge to transform society as we have to do in this cluster. Thank you very much. Have a good day.